Amen. Thank you so much for the welcome. I want to thank Dr. Aiken for the opportunity as well as the faculty that I get to serve alongside of, the opportunity to stand in this pulpit. I don't take that lightly, and so I pray that our time this morning will be fruitful uh, for our walk with the Lord. Thank you, Dr. Whitfield, for the introduction. It is one of the greatest privileges of my life to uh, pastor a local church. It is a joy and uh, I would not trade it for the world. By the way, it's probably one of the only times that you will have the person introducing a speaker uh, as well as the speaker who are both fans of the NCAA National Football Champions. Uh, as long as Dr. Aiken is here preaching or introducing, we're not in hopes that both of us will be Tiger fans because the Bulldogs, Dr. Aiken, are probably not going far for a long time. But anyway, <laughs> That's because he's not here, I can say that today. He's traveling. I had uh, considered what I, would, what I would lecture on today, and uh, for those of you who are uh, following things, I thought about social justice and then thought about I better do something a little different. And so uh, I thought about my ministry here at Southeastern and my ministry in the local church, and I have spent the last 15 years teaching as part of the faculty here at Southeastern. In the fall of 2004, uh, it was not the first time that I'd stepped on Southeastern's campus. That was back in 1996 when I started my seminary journey. When I started seminary, I was working as a student pastor at a local church, my home church in South Carolina. And not long after I started seminary, I was invited to be a part of a church planting team uh, in a different city in South Carolina. The planting pastor had come and talked to me about coming alongside and being a part of this church plant, and I was going to go and be a part of the student ministry uh, of the church plant. I was incredibly excited about the opportunity to, uh, to help plant a church. I was really green, inexperienced, uh, but I had the commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ, felt like I understood that and how to speak that into the lives of those that I'd be ministering to, and I had a great desire to see lives transformed by the gospel. But what I soon found out is I really had no idea of uh, the messiness of life, the messiness that I would encounter in the lives of the teenagers that I was ministering to and the messiness in the parents' lives of those very teenagers, nor did I really know how to connect God's word with God's world in a way that could speak into that messiness of life. Don't get me wrong, I thought I had the right tools. I'd done an undergraduate at Anderson University and my major was in psychology. My major professors in college were a Freudian psychoanalyst and a Skinnerian behaviorist. And they had given me the tools to understand human behavior and the questions that I was now asking with people helping ministry or so I thought. Then ministry hit me between the eyes. Melissa was a young girl from a broken home that was always downcast when she was with us. As I got to know her, I found out that she struggled with depression and anxiety and often was so low that she didn't want to live. I got an opportunity to speak in her life as well as some of her family, but the day that I got the call that Melissa had attempted suicide by taking a full bottle of pills she had found in their medicine counter was one of the most sobering days of my early ministry. I had visions of ministry filled with preaching the word, sharing the gospel, planning outreach and doing evangelism, seeing people saved and discipled, but I didn't really include in my vision the messiness of real life. When Mandy calls and asks you to meet with her and her daughter about a major issue and you sit down with Mandy and Susie, her 14-year-old daughter, and Susie's been coming to your church for almost her whole life, she stares at the floor as they sit there in your office. As her mother recounts Susie's withdrawal from her family, the change that had been a bit drastic, but Mandy really kind of thought, well, maybe it's just a part of her being a teenager. Susie never opened up. She never really smiled. She never really opened up to the, her mother or those in our church. She mostly just wanted to stay in her room alone. Mandy had tried and tried to talk to her daughter, um, wanted her to be the old Susie, but the more she tried, the more Susie kind of shut down and shut her out. 
Was this just normal teenage changes or was there something more? It wasn't until late spring when the temperatures rose into the mid to upper 90s for an entire week that Mandy noticed Susie was still wearing her sweatshirts. She got suspicious, but she kind of played it off. But finally, she asked Susie about it, but Susie blew it off and just said, I'm always cold, Mom, until Mandy walked into her own daughter's room one morning as Susie was getting up, or excuse me, getting ready for bed. And Susie grabbed a blanket and threw it over her arms immediately. That mom went over and said, what's going on? What are you covering up? And she went and found Susie had scars on her arms as well as fresh cuts on her arms. Now she's in my office asking me, what do we do? As I talk with Susie, Susie looks at me with shame, still down, her eyes down to the floor and says, I, I've tried to stop, I just can't. When I cut myself, I feel a sense of relief from the pain that's inside of me. I know it's wrong, but it's the only thing I know to do. Mandy's devastated. Susie feels trapped. They're both asking, what, what do we do? The messiness of life, friends, didn't go away when I left student ministry. As a matter of fact, I just found out that it is pervasive in all of our lives. I've been a pastor for just over 20 years now, and I've been invited into all kinds of messiness that I would have never thought that we would see. Whether it's adultery or same-sex attraction in both single and married folks, addictions to all sorts of drugs, alcohol, anxiety attacks, depression from what I would call a melancholy spirit all the way to debilitating, paralyzing depression, divorce, money laundering, suicide, death of children. We could go on and on and on. Our lives and the lives of those we care for and the lives of those that we minister to inside and outside the church are messy. While I thought I knew a bit of the ins and outs of exegesis, theology, ethics when I went into the ministry, it wasn't until I faced the real messiness of life that I had to do the hard work of connecting my seminary training with ministry. So I've spent the last 20 years both teaching and in pastoral ministry thinking and trying, attempting to practice this idea of connecting God's word to God's world. As I've attempted this in ministry and while teaching here, I've discovered many, many models and theories that attempt to show us how to understand and help people with the messiness of life. Along the way, I've developed what I call the four basic questions about human beings. And I want to give those to you as kind of a foundation of where we're headed in the text of Scripture this morning. Four basic questions about human beings that every model, every theory, every book that purports to help people in the messiness of life must answer, regardless of religion, regardless of worldview, regardless of even the solution offered or the diagnosis given, whether it's secular or Christian, humanist or existential or Freudian or Rogerian, it doesn't matter. Every theory that wants to help us help people will answer these four questions. And I think they are key to you and I understanding how to do people helping ministry from a biblical perspective and from a gospel-centered ministry. Everyone who offers a way to understand human life and behavior will answer these questions. And they'll help us, by the way, evaluate actual teaching by others, the merit of any model. So I want to offer them to you today as a help with the resources that you will encounter as you help others, as you try to make sense of the messiness of life, and as you try to care for others along the path. So let me give them to you. Question number one, what is the nature of human beings? Now, clearly, we could spend an entire semester on that question. The answer to this question flows primarily from a worldview. If you hold a naturalistic worldview, that the human being then is nothing more than a material being. The physical is all there is. So that would determine how you answer this question of the nature of human beings. So for example, B.F. Skinner would say that human beings are made up of nothing more and nothing less than every other organism in the universe. The Bible speaks to this question, by the way, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. The Bible says, Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and he became a living being. What that tells us is there's something earthy about us. He took the dust of the ground. He took the material world and formed a body. But then God breathed the breath of life, so there's something spiritual about us. 
I call this in my teaching an inner and outer man. The second question is, why do we do what we do? Why do we do what we do? This is the crucial question to help us understand people. At our core, why do we do the things that we do, whether you're Mandy or Susie or you or I? The, one of the fathers in psychotherapy movement, Sigmund Freud, said that you're a bundle of instincts and drives. That's how he answers the question, what is the nature of man? By the way, those are mostly sexual for Freud. So you do what you do because it's instinctual, because you have physical drives that are telling you. Skinner, who said that we're nothing more than a physical being, says that you do things or don't do them because of reinforcements or punishments for those behaviors. Maslow, who is another uh, theorist who has really impacted Christian thought, says you do the things that you do because at the base of who you are, you're a bundle of needs and you behave in order to have those needs filled. That's why you do what you do. Christianity has been influenced by that. Perhaps you have read books that would say at the base of who we are, we are a love tank or a love bank or we have a wild heart. And so we do what we do because we need those needs of for wildness or love filled. And I wanna address this one today. So let's move on before we come back to question two. The third question is this, what is wrong with us? The answer to this question is about the cause of behavior and how the cause of behavior determines, or how we see the cause of our behavior, why we do what we do, determines how we answer this question, then what is wrong? Every theory has a belief about what is wrong with human beings. Skinner would say, your schedule of reinforcers or punishers is off, producing unwanted behavior. Freud would say, your drives and instincts are at odds with one another, and so they create anxiety in you. Maslow would say, your needs are not being sufficiently met. Carl Ellis, a a cognitive behavioral theorist, would say, your thinking is wrong, and that produces your behavior, so you've got to change your thinking. That's what's wrong with you. The Bible, does it give us an idea of what is wrong with human beings to the cause of the problems of living? I think so. But let's move on. The final question is, how do we change? How do we change? Each model, each theory, every book that you read on people helping or in the self-help section of the bookstore offers a path toward healing and and wholeness. Whether it be a behavior modification schedule or a genuine relationship in which you can be congruent with at least one other person who understands you and accepts you unconditionally, or perhaps it's years of psychoanalysis, every theory has a prognosis and a plan for improvement for you. While each of these questions this morning deserves our great attention, I want to spend the remainder of my time on that second one. Why do we do what we do? David Pallison, a prominent writer in the biblical counseling movement, calls this the motivation question, and he says it's the most important question to ask when evaluating a theory of counseling. So if you would, this morning, take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Indeed, if we can pinpoint the cause or causes of behavior, we will indeed be able to diagnose and then help others when they are faced with the messiness of life because of their own behavior. Some of you have heard other biblical counselors like Paul Tripp or David Pallison address this and speak of this cause of behavior in terms of worship. I do what I do because I worship what I worship. Many of you may have even heard about Paul Tripp, and I would absolutely recommend his book. It's one of the top five books that I would recommend every pastor to own. And by owning it, I don't just mean have it on your shelf. I mean you own it. You know it. His instrument's in the Redeemer's hands. In that book, Paul Tripp gives the principle of inescapable influence where he says, what I worship exercises inescapable influence over my behavior. For many years, I've taught that principle and defined worship as what we love, fear, and desire. So if what I worship determines my behavior, how do I know what I worship? And the Bible uses words like love, our affections, fear, what I fear or what I fear will be or what I fear will not be the case. That leads into an awe, a reverence, more than just being terrified. It's a, it's a, It's an awe or fear of something, the Bible would use it in both ways, or my desire. So what I love, fear, and desire determines what I worship. So you go to James 4, for example. James says, why do you have quarrels and fights among you? Is it not this, that your desires are at war within you? 
We desire and do not have, so we covet and murder. We fight and wage war. And so there, James is saying, your desires are at war within you, and they are why you have fights. It's not because somebody else. It's what's going on inside of you. So what we love, we worship. What we fear, we worship. What we desire, we worship. We hold that above everything else. And what we worship determines what we do. Paul Tripp, in his book, Instruments, uses Luke chapter 6 and the teaching of Jesus to show us there's a connection between the root of our life, which is our heart, and the fruit of our life, which is our behavior, and the root determines the fruit. For the last couple of years, though, I've been asking the question, why do we love what we love? How do I understand why I love? Why do I fear what I fear? Why do I desire what I desire? If what I love, fear, and desire is what I worship, then what is driving that love, fear, and desire? In other words, is there something more fundamental in the human life that determines what we love, fear, and desire? And I think perhaps so. I love something because I believe it is worthy of love. I fear something or the lack of it because of what I believe about it. I desire something because of what I believe about it. So somehow, belief or faith is foundational. What I believe is what I want to get to. Okay, so where do then my beliefs come from? My beliefs about what I love, fear, and desire. This is where I want to bring us to the text of Scripture this morning and see if we can develop the beginning of a model of understanding why we do what we do and look at how faith is the key to the answer to that question. So Hebrews chapter 11, would you read with me the text of Scripture? I'll read the first six verses from the CSB. Hear the word of the Lord. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it our ancestors won God's approval. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, we all live our lives by faith. We live based on the things we trust to be true and right and significant and important and meaningful. You cannot do otherwise. You were made this way. You live your life with a particular orientation toward what you trust and believe in. You are a person of faith. While Hebrews chapter 11 is in this wonderful book and it's speaking about a particular kind of faith, namely those who have faith in the sure promises of God to send Jesus Christ as Redeemer and King, this text also gives us an understanding of faith in general. And so I want us to spend the rest of our time this morning looking at three undeniable facts about faith from Hebrews chapter 11. Three undeniable facts about faith. Number one, faith is is the reality, is a reality in our lives. Faith is a reality in our lives. Hebrews chapter 11 starts by teaching us these basics. There are two assertions made about faith in verse one. Look at them. Faith is the reality of what is hoped for. It is the proof of what is not seen. This text teaches us that there is something hoped for, but not yet seen. Now, everyone is living with some ideal, something that they hope for. Psychologists would tell us that people are living for happiness. One thing that you will discover in ministry is that everybody is wanting happiness and they're looking for what is going to deliver what they define as happiness. Some people would call this um, what people hope for, meaningfulness in life or purpose in life or satisfaction in life or contentment in life. We're looking for something and psychologists try to define it in a lot of different ways. This morning, I'm just going to call that for our time together, if you will allow me to, true life. However you want to define it, what are you hoping for is the major question. What you hope for is what we will call this morning true life, the ideal that I'm living for. By the way, this is also, this ideal is what ends up sending us into anxiety and depression and all sorts of of psychological trauma. Why? We don't experience the true life that we have and we lose hope to have it. 
Now we hope on micro level things for this true life. There are significant things that we hope for that we would put in the category of true life. We hope for good grades. We hope to graduate seminary or college. We hope for a great marriage. We hope to have children or we hope to get a job or we hope to retire in a specific year. There are a lot of significant things on a micro level that we hope for. There are more insignificant things that we hope for as well on that micro level like winning the basketball championship that uh, is being played this month and next or winning a football championship or we hope it doesn't rain again tomorrow. We hope for small things in our lives as well. Then there are macro level things, the ultimate issues of life that we hope for, and we define true life by these. We hope to be forgiven of sins. We hope to live eternally. We hope to know God. These macro issues keep the micro issues in perspective. By the way, problems occur in our lives when we get the micro issues and the macro issues reversed or confused. So, We begin to find a formula here for faith. Everyone has faith. It's a reality for all of us. We hope for what we believe is true life. And we have not yet experienced what we hope for, Hebrews 1 says. We can then understand the reality of faith this way. Faith is believing in the possibility of a future realization of true life. This brings us to the first major question of faith. What do you hope for? In other words, what is true life for you? What does true happiness or satisfaction or contentment or meaning look like for you? And not only for you, friends, as you're in ministry, begin to ask that question as you are entering into the messiness of life. What does this person hope for? How do they define true life? The first question then leads us to the second major question of faith. What do you believe will deliver true life? The true life that you hope for. What do you believe will deliver the true life that you hope for. This second and most important question brings us to the second undeniable fact about faith in this text. Not only is faith a reality in our lives, secondly, faith resides in something or someone. In other words, faith has an object. Faith is not just some abstract concept. It is not that you just have to believe. It is that you have to believe something. Hebrews 11 makes faith very real. It is a concrete concept in Hebrews chapter 11. It is the reality of what we hope for. It is the proof of what is not yet seen. If you hope for true life, the key and most important question for you is then, what will deliver the true life that you're hoping for? This is the object of your faith, the place, the place your faith resides. The reality that you believe delivers true life the proof of true life for you. So I come with a working definition of faith out of that. Faith is a firm trust in something or someone to deliver what I hope for, but do not yet fully experience. Faith is a firm trust in something or someone to deliver what I hope for, but do not yet fully experience. So if true life then, let's go back to some of those lighter micro issues. If true life would be your team winning the NCAA tournament next month, what will deliver that for you? Well, some of you say, well, the right coaching would or the right players on your team. So we would have to have the right recruiting or Somebody would say a little luck will help you get there because somebody always gets a run through the brackets. Whatever you believe will deliver true life is your faith. It's the reality of what you hope for. It's the proof of what you hope for. So if true life is for you getting married, then what will deliver that for you? If true life is getting this job, then What will deliver that for you? If true life is, and you fill in the blank, what do you believe will deliver that? There are five major idols that I want to call your attention to this morning just as a matter of help for you because you're going to confront these in ministry over and over and over again. And let me be really personal here. You're not only going to confront them in ministry, you're going to confront them in your own heart. What do you believe will deliver what you think is true life? The first one is approval. The Bible calls it the fear of man. If others approve me, like me, accept me, whatever you want to define it as, if I get enough likes on my Instagram post, then life is worth living. That's true life. If I were to have this many followers, or and you don't put titles on it, but you think that way. Approval is one of the major idols that you will put your trust in to deliver true life for you. Second one is possessions. The Bible says an incredible amount about money and possessions. 
The easiest way to state this is if we keep up with the Joneses, then we'll be happy, satisfied, content. But I must have more and more. Another one is power. If I have control over my life and perhaps those around me, if I could just control them, and this goes to a sinful way and it goes to a a turning in way where you don't have power but you desire it. Power, if I could just control my life and those around me, then I would have satisfaction or happiness, position. If I could just get that job or that position, I would be happy and content. If I, Lord, if you'll just give me that, then I'll be there. Your faith is in whatever that is to deliver true life. The last one is pleasure. This could be in the, in the line of an addiction to drugs or, or pornography or alcohol, or, or this could be on the side of comfort, of pleasure as comfort. I have to have sleep or rest or food. The problem here is that all of these are good gifts that God has given us to use under his authority, but they are not meant to be the reality of true life. They're good gifts to enjoy. They're not meant to be the proof of true life. They're not meant to be what we hope for. So the Bible does describe what it is. So go back to Hebrews 11 and look at verse 3. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things not visible. Now notice this. To answer the question that is before us, what will we trust to deliver true life? This entire chapter of Hebrews is talking about those who live by biblical faith. And to answer that question, the Bible goes back to creation. The Bible says, look at everything around you. That was created by God and it was created by God speaking. God spoke and it was. You're meant to notice in verse three, friends, that God's power and ability are what would draw you to trust him. Notice his power. I don't know if you think you have power to create. We are creative people, but we don't have power like God has power. I noticed this week that one of my favorite establishments that I try to avoid more than I used to is Krispy Kreme Donuts, and they are giving out green donuts. I don't know about you, but I could never just speak and create donuts. It would not be a good thing if I could. You could even give me flour and sugar on my desk and I still could not do it. I would fail at trying to create it. If I can't create that, how in the world would I ever think that I was gonna create the elements of the world? God did. You're meant to notice his power and his ability here. You're also meant to notice not only his power, but his ownership. The creator, God, owns it all. It is his, this is his story, his world, This is his life that you're living, which means, friends, that my life, my marriage, my children, my job, my recreation, my suffering, my ministry, none of them belong to me. They are his because I am his. His power and authority lead to his ownership. By the way, as you think about this, doesn't it make sense then that the one who created everything that is from nothing, the one who owns all that he created, including you, Don't you think that he is the one who can rightly define what true life is? This calls us to trust God to deliver true life to us, no matter the circumstances around us. So you'll bring up in this text, Abraham, he received a promise from God. You're going to have a son, his name is Isaac, through whom your descendants, his descendants, would be as numerous as the stars of the sky and the sands of the seashore. And when God tests Abraham's faith, he says, I want you to give me your son Isaac. And when Isaac then asked his father, what is going on? Abraham replies to his son in Genesis 22, eight, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. What's Abraham doing? He's saying, my life doesn't belong to me. God's the creator. Even you, Isaac, you don't belong to me. You belong to him. That's faith. That's saying, what I hope for is true life. God has told me it's coming through you. Life, land, relationship with God. And so if he wants you back, I'm giving you back because I trust him. He defines true life. I trust him. Move over into the Old Testament to Daniel and his friends who are facing the fiery furnace. 
their very lives are at stake and they confess in that wonderful passage our God is able to deliver us but even if he does not we will not bow and worship a false God why our lives belong to him he defines true life and so if he would take us into the fire then that's true life for me I'm trusting him when Job is tested he confesses his faith with these words in Job chapter 13 verse 15 though he slay me though he slay me I will still trust in him not only does God want you to notice his power and his ownership here in Hebrews 11 he wants us to notice his wisdom notice what he says God made what we do see from things that are not visible that's creation out of nothing so if God made what we do see from things that we don't see don't you think you can trust him with the things that you don't see in your life you look around and know that he created everything that we do see then the things that we don't we can trust him with those as well friends here are the undeniable facts about faith it is a reality of our lives what do you hope for it resides in something or someone what are you trusting to deliver what you hope for the third undeniable fact about faith is this faith is rewarded by God faith is rewarded by God if the most important question of your faith is this what do you believe will deliver true life then we're left with a final question does it deliver does it deliver if you're living for approval and I've had a lot of folks sitting in my office over these years and I'm just saying true life for them is being approved by everyone and they believe that that'll be delivered by everyone liking them or everyone approving or affirming of them what you find out is there are not enough likes on your Instagram page to deliver true life for you there are not enough words of affirmation from your congregants there are not enough people that will walk out and say it's the best sermon you're the best leader you're the best preacher you're the best there are not enough of those to deliver true life for you if it's possessions if you don't already know this you need to hear it you'll never have enough you'll never have enough you always want one more you always want something more it never delivers true life ever power you'll discover that you'll never have enough power to deliver true life you'll never have enough positions you'll be chasing them for the rest of your life if you're counting on some position to deliver true life pleasures the same way it's empty it's empty friends God will have the final say and we learned that in Hebrews chapter 11 here he will judge all things the Bible says while we've been speaking about faith in general and getting some understanding about faith Hebrews 11 really is speaking about biblical faith in the one true God so verse 2 says for by it by faith our ancestors won God's approval the Creator who owns it all is saying to those that we're reading about in Hebrews 11 I approve how you believed believed what verse 6 he starts to give us an understanding of it without faith it is impossible to please God since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him they won God's approval the Old Testament Saints that you read about here in Hebrews 11 they won salvation by grace through faith it's always been that way faith in the word of our eternal God you see the truth of God's Word is this God will judge my life and my faith my faith will end in either commendation or condemnation every one of us live by faith in something and when you stand before the judge of all mankind you will either be condemned or commended so verse 4 we have a comparison Abel's faith versus Cain's faith 
Abel offered the best of his animals. Cain offered a portion of his grain. Abel's sacrifice showed his trust that a blood sacrifice was required for the atonement of our sins. He trusted God's way. His faith, the Bible says, still speaks to us today. What is it speaking? Will you trust God to deliver true life? Will you trust God's way? Which ultimately, the sacrifices are pointing to Christ. In verse 5, we have another comparison. Enoch and all of the patriarchs of Genesis 5. You read through the, the account by Moses in Genesis 5, and you have so-and-so lived this many years. He had these sons and daughters. He lived this many more years, and then he died. So-and-so lived this many years. He had these sons and daughters. He lived this many years more, and then he died. So-and-so had this many uh, years, and then he, he lived this many years, and he had this many sons and daughters, and then he lived this many years, and he died. You get that, that pattern that you're running through Genesis chapter 5 in the table of nations, and you get to Enoch, and everything slows down. And the Bible says, Enoch walked with God, and he was no more. So, author of Hebrews brings us here to compare Enoch to the rest of those who lived, had sons and daughters, and died. Tells us here he was taken away. So he did not experience death. He was not found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, watch this, he was approved as one who pleased God. Friends, that gives us a great lesson. Hear me this morning. The consequence of sin is death. And it hits you in the face when the first generation after Adam and Eve, one son kills another. And the degradation and sinfulness just gets saturated through all of creation. You come to Genesis 5 and everybody's living and dying. Could, it, could the promise of Genesis 3.15 be Seth? No, he lived and died. Could it be? And you go down through the, the list of all of these generations and he dies and he dies and he dies and death seems to reign. But then you have this glimmer of hope. By faith, Enoch walked with God and he was no more. He believed in the promises of God. He had faith in the one true living God. And so we come to verse 6 now. Faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. He gives us a hint here of true life in this verse, doesn't he? Draw near to God. There's a picture of true life for you. And then he gives us the basics of what we are to believe. God exists, and he is the judge. So as you minister to others in the messiness of life, and you experience the same messiness in your own life, begin by asking a couple of questions. What does this person hope for? What do I hope for? What is true life for me? What is meaning and happiness and satisfaction and contentment and meaning or purpose? What is true life for me? What do I hope for? And what do I believe will deliver true life? What does this person in this moment, in this situation, what do they believe will deliver true life? Then as you expose their faith, you will see what they believe will deliver true life is what they love. If it's approval, they love it. They fear not having it. They desire it. If it's possessions or power, position, all of these things, what I believe will deliver true life is what I ultimately love, fear, and desire. And that is what's controlling my behavior. So as you have the opportunity to speak in to the messiness, point them to the one that can and does deliver and define true life in Jesus Christ. The one who takes our messiness, the messiness of our lives and the lives that those were counseling, shepherding, he turns it into beauty and glory by his own grace, by his own power. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the word. Help us as we consider it in our lives that you would be pleased in us to take our hearts, draw them to you, to show us the wonder of creation, 
as it points us to the Creator. The wonder of the gospel as it assures us of the promise of new life. And God, grow our faith that we might love, fear, and desire the only one worthy of our worship. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you.